fix it all up. Is it live? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Sandy Quinn, and I'm president of the Old Town Preservation Association. Uh, our mission is to protect and preserve um, and enhance the historic character and the very unique charm of Old Town. And tonight's uh, uh, our seventh state of Old Town. Can somebody turn my phone off? <laughs> It's just my dog, Google. <clears throat> it's our seventh annual State of Old Town Forum. And our mission for the forum is to inform and to educate and to bring people closer, uh, closer to government. So uh, we're, we've got a great panel and a great program, but I want to mention a couple of OTPA programs before we start. And one of them is the OTPA uh, 25th Annual Preservation Awards, Garden Party, and Dinner Gala, which is May 15th at the Women's Club. Go online to otpa.org and you'll, you'll get more information. It's a great opportunity to be uh, with the, to have fun and, and meet your, your uh, friends and neighbors uh, in, a, in an evening that uh, is in the gardens at first and then inside uh, for the dinner. Uh, later in the year, in October, uh, on October 8th and 9th, we will have our 18th annual historic home tour. And uh, Chris Gloss, our chairman, has lined up a, a great group of, of homes and, and, and historic buildings, a terrific uh, uh, home tour set up this year. And I think tickets are available now if you want to order them online, again, otpa.org. On, on November 12th, is our third annual Art of Wine Gala. And this supports and funds our, um, our Ann Siebert Preservation Interns. The interns, we now have a program with the City of Orange where we have interns uh, working in the Community Development Office uh, working on preservation projects. And I think our first, our inaugural intern is here tonight, uh, Carolyn Gardner. Carolyn, are you, are you here? <clears throat> uh, she's a history major at Chapman and apparently couldn't get out of class. Uh, so <clears throat> that's good, stay in class. Or she's here working intern projects. <clears throat> uh, but she's, uh, she's terrific and we're looking for other interns. If you, uh, if you have uh, somebody who's interested in history or architecture or, or uh, construction or preservation, uh, uh, go online to the City of, uh, of Orange uh, uh, Preservation Intern Applications or, again, to otpa.org, and we'll be in touch with you. And, yes, we pay. They're, they're paid honorariums. Um, we've got a, a, a terrific panel. Uh, they're seated behind me wondering why I'm not introducing them, and I'll start uh, with uh, Mayor Mark Murphy, uh, who all of you know, I'm sure, he's a native of Orange, been on planning commission, city council, and, and several times mayor. Mayor, thank you for participating. We have District 1 Councilwoman uh, Ariana Barrios here. Uh, now that the city is divided up uh, politically into districts, uh, she's the first, uh, the inaugural, the premier councilwoman from District 1. And she lives right smack in the middle of it, and we're glad to have her here tonight, too. Uh, Rob Houston, um, maybe you haven't met Rob yet. Rob is our new city manager. He comes to us from the city of uh, Fountain Valley, and before that, where he was city manager, and before that, he was assistant city manager in, uh, in Newport Beach. Uh, we've had the opportunity to sit down with him. We're, we're delighted to have Rob in the city. Uh, he's a young, talented, uh, experienced uh, uh, manager, and I'm sure, we'll, uh, I hope all of you will get to know him. These people will be available outside afterwards if you want to have a, a few minutes with him. Uh, we, the police chief, uh, Dan Adams. Dan has been uh, with the city in the police department for 32 years. He started as chief uh, last year in July, I think, of 
Yes, of, wasn't it last year in July? Uh, Nate. <clears throat> and he's done a great job uh, for our city uh, over the last 32 uh, years. Uh, we have uh, Vice President of Community Relations from Chapman University, Alyssa Driscoll, who runs their outreach program. And her job is to keep us up to date on what goes on at Chapman and Chapman management up to date on what goes on in the, in the, in the city. Um, so thank you all for coming. Here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to sit down. They're going to do five minutes apiece. And they're, they'll speak on the state of the city and what their priorities are. Now, if you want to ask questions, uh, we've taken questions online. And many of you have sent them in. So we have a lot of questions to ask. If you'd like to submit one, behind me on the screen is the phone number, I hope, yeah, I think. It's coming up. I'm sure it is. I know it is. There it is. <laughs> um, so call it in, and, uh, and Tony will uh, take it down, and we'll submit it to the panel. So we're going to start with, um, with uh, Mayor Murphy, and the floor is yours, Mayor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thanks again to uh, OTPA for hosting and uh, inviting and putting this event together. Um, it's a great time, I believe, to be back together. It's so nice to see faces without masks, unless, it, unless it's a choice or need to have one, and we certainly respect that. But it was a long couple of years of pandemic, and I always like to start by saying thank you. Uh, the level of cooperation was amazing. And when we asked everybody to do a lot of tough things along the way, and that's citizenry, the businesses, um, frankly, just the delivery of services uh, from a city perspective as well. And so we're happy to be back and we're happy to have you all back as well. And I can tell you from a physical standpoint, um, the city is in great uh, shape. We had some money for the rainy day. Luckily, it wasn't as rainy this go-round as some past ebbs and flows. And yet, we've also been able to accomplish a number of things along the way. It wasn't an issue where we stopped doing things. We just had to do things a little bit differently. Let's focus on uh, downtown a little bit and Old Town. We've divided up the topic, so it may look like we're jumping around a little bit, but uh, wanted to try and cover a number of things that might be of interest to, to uh um, you all, Fire Station 1, directly up the street, how many people have driven by it? Yeah? All right. Well, I'm happy to report that uh, it is uh, on schedule, actually slightly ahead of schedule, and believe it or not, under budget, which is uh, no mean feat related to uh, this was bid in 2019 and 2020. And I imagine you all have recognized the fact that the cost of doing building and then just about everything else has significantly changed since then. We're going to have a, we're targeting to have a, a opening ceremony in September and would encourage you all to come down uh, for that. You'll note that that station is much larger than the old headquarters station. It allows the rigs to be driven through rather than uh, backed in and there's safety related to that. But as well, it offers up the opportunity to house the equipment and the things required for today's firefighters and the rest. And don't worry. We didn't leave out the police department as well. Their facility is being updated and upgraded as well. Um, not certainly to the same level, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, being improved as well. Um, what the other question that naturally comes along that is what are we going to do with the old one, right? And I will tell you that's, that's TBD. We've got uh, folks looking at alternatives and assessments. I will share with you it's not seismically retrofit. And there, are, there is no access to the second story other than by stairs. Used to be the pole in there, but the pole got moved to the first station. So, uh, um, so we'll see what happens there. It'll come back and have a public review from that end of things. Um, while we're talking about things that are under review, the Paseo, again, thank you for all those that uh, participated or were affected by it. Um, we have charted the staff to go out and do the environmental research necessary for any alternative related to the Paseo, uh, whether it be just certain parts of the year, whether it be never again in a fond memory, or whether it be a complete um, uh, deployment like we did before. 
and all that will come back and uh, um, be reviewed and debated later on this year. But we're going to do all the analysis required legally to ensure that when we do come back to discuss it, that we have the alternatives in front rather than wondering, you know, is this legal, is this not legal, et cetera, et cetera. So we're doing the environmental and the legal work up front, and then we'll take a look at, at what the alternatives are. It did definitely solve or at least help address the issues economics-wise during the shutdown, and I want to thank everybody for that as well. Um, I'll talk about uh, um, everybody's favorite, I think, right now, which are the yellow dividers in the plaza. The pork chop, as they call it, right, the dividers. As you know, we have a number of folks that uh, seem to believe that they can drive straight through the plaza to put their dip their toe in the fountain while they're still in the car. And I joke, but it, it's a scary situation given the amount of people that are now enjoying the park plaza and the, and the, uh, and the rest. And so we did put those up as an interim solution while we're looking at some permanent solutions, including potentially bollards that are going to go in the uh, walkways on each side that pass uh, through because all of the issues have been east and west traffic. And ironically, since we put up the, uh, the um, um, yellow dividers, and, and I'm being polite, they're not very attractive, I'll be the first one to raise my hand on that. Ironically, we have not had an accident since then. So it's a matter of finding something that's more um, complementary to the situation, I believe, and yet also provides safety from that end of things. Um, Chapman University, the Hilbert Museum, how many people have been there? How many people know about the expansion? Almost three, almost a 3x expansion of the Hilbert Museum, and it's uh, about ready to uh, award the um, grading permits on, on that for the expansion. It's going to include a Millard Sheets mosaic that was most recently uh, um, available to look at up in Santa Monica at a home savings and loan that will that be fe a featured uh, uh, effect of it. But uh, we're excited to see that, and obviously that then dictates that the dance school, sorry, I'm stealing your thunder no. here. Um, the, da the, dance the dance school is moving uh, uh, to new facility in the packing house as well, which, which we're excited about. Um, I want to touch on a couple of other things uh, events-wise, since we already talked about the OTPA events, but the May Parade is coming back on May the 7th. I hope you guys are planning on either participating or at least being in the crowd. Um, the 75th anniversary of Mendez versus Westminster presentation, I believe it runs between or up through the 30th of June in the Library and History Center. Um, the concert series in the park starts this summer uh, from June to August. And next week, if you're available, come on down to the band show where we have the concerts in the park in the summer. There'll be a, um, uh, an event to um, recognize and receive uh, slightly in excess of $2 million from, count, or from Congressman Luke, excuse me, Luke Correa uh, that will go to enhancements in uh, Hart Park. And that does include uh, pickleball, by the way, if anybody is a pickleball fan in the audience, uh, but also fitness and some other improvements uh, to the park as well. Um, the traditional summer camps and everything are here. Certainly the uh, Community Foundation, too, is hosting an event uh, for Memorial Day uh, weekend uh, at City Hall here, too. So watch for some of that. I believe I've taken my five minutes and maybe even six, so I'll save some of the rest of the things. And I think if I remember the or orchestration, I'm, I'm to look to my left and uh, ask uh, Councilwoman Barrios to speak next. So, Councilwoman Barrios. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's nice to be back after two whole days. So um, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned all the events that are going on in Old Town um, and that happen right here in the heart of our city. Um, and it really showcases the fact that so much happens right here in the heart of our city and not just events, but so many of kind of the impacts of, of where we're growing our city are happening right here. So it's really an interesting time. I feel really strongly that 
we are at a really interesting crossroads as far as Orange is concerned and as far as certainly as far as Old Town. So as a representative for District 1, which includes all of the Old Town District, many of you probably know that we adopted a new map um, with the districts. So what that changes, every single district changed somewhat. And for District 1, what changed on that was that now District 1 comes to Batavia. And with that, all of the hospital district, everything over by town and country, which used to be in District 1, is now part of District 2. The nice part about the change is that all of the historic Cy Cypress Barrio neighborhood is now in District 1, which I feel it always should have been, um, definitely needs to be protected, have the oversight of OTPA and District 1 as just the historic significance of that area. Um, most of you probably know if you live anywhere near the plaza, um, all of the different and new things that are coming into the plaza area. Um, so I picked uh, three or four to talk about. Um, they put uh, the specific Chapman specific plan in my, um, on my list, but I'm saving that for you because I think that's all you <laughs> and that's good. Um, but just on, you know, Maple past the plaza is going to be the Richland Hotel, which is the old Shannon Mortuary. So that's going to be a four uh, bedroom, a four room boutique hotel plus event center. Um, the old Schroeder Art Studio is going to be a Chipotle um, with a small little, um, I guess it's not a garden, but maybe like a little patio off the back that encroaches into the parking area. Um, in addition, uh, the First Presbyterian Church, which is on Maple and it is bordered by Orange and Grand, um, is going to be transforming in a public, private, a public, a partnership agreement, development agreement that's going to turn that um, administration building into offices, as well as a restaurant and a, and I believe some type of retail down below. Um, if you didn't already know, then you know that the old YW YMCA building on Grand has been turned into the Grand Giamo, uh, which is an event space, uh, outdoor, indoor, um, the old gym is all transformed. And the reason I asked to talk about these three things, is, or four things actually, is because it really underscores all that is happening in Old Town. And I did want to take the opportunity to thank OTPA. It is not easy to fight for our residents and our neighbors and to say, how can we make these projects less impactful or really be balanced in terms of what our residents need? And OTPA has really stood up, maybe not always in the way we would all like them, which is no more growth. We can't do that. We have to find a middle ground and OTPA is always there trying to find a middle ground and to speak for us when we don't even know some of these things are happening. So I really thank them for being um, a, a part of, of that conversation because it's so important. Um, the final thing I just wanted to say is um, just to thank you. Uh, we're going to go through elections again. District 1 draw the, drew the short straw. So um, this seat will be up for election in um, this November. And so anything can happen. But I thank you all for being here, for being willing to listen, and to find out more about what's going on in our city. And I think, do I pass to you? Or do I go the other way? He gets to Mr. Houston. All right. And I will say that when we interviewed Mr. Houston, he had the single best answer for code enforcement where I just went, bravo. And this is, I, I'm really excited that he's part of our city now. Well, thank you for the intro. Now I have to deliver, right? <laughs> Great to meet everyone here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, get to meet more of you afterwards if there's that opportunity. But uh, I'm enjoying uh, week five with the city of Orange here. And I uh, have enjoyed many days getting my lunch or even taking a walk through areas of Old Town and hearing a lot of the history from uh, many of the people that uh, know that history. And it's a real precious gem that I appreciate this group and the council and the staff's united um, efforts to preserve and yet enhance this great area. And uh, many of the highlights have already been touched on. I'll cover just a few. Uh, just some new items, as was mentioned, that are getting added always uh, to the uh, key Old Town area. On the corner of Chapman and Olive, there's a new coffee shop coming, uh, Black Dot Coffee, I believe is the way it's termed. Uh, that'll be coming shortly. They're going to go to the work of um, cleaning up the 80s stucco front of that building, restoring, I guess, some hidden uh, uh, transit transom windows that were behind there, bring them out. Uh, sandblast the place, bring uh, some nice historic doors, bring that back to uh, a historic level. 
So that'll be a nice add. And in the Wells Fargo building, actually another coffee shop, Play Coffee, will be coming. It's just going through its uh, plan check. And so that'll be a great place to bring people back to the bank. Those are just some new ads. Um, I will mention as well that we do have um, something, if you ever see a code enforcement issue or uh, a fix-it issue, a pothole, you name it, uh, on your phone, be it Apple or Android, you can look up the Orange 24-7 app. Just want to make sure, download that. It's great. You just take a photo of the issue, uh, type it, you send it in. It'll register with staff. It actually will take your location, which helps them identify if you're, you know, if you're not sure even where exactly it is. Sometimes those mid-block areas can be hard. It's like, well, I'm sort of 300 feet from, uh, just take the picture, pull it out, send it in. And then you'll get an update of the progress of those fixes because your eyes are really helpful in helping keep our city well. We don't have enough staff to be running through every street every day, so you can help us with that to clean up our place and make it look even better. And uh, in addition, uh, uh, Council Member Barrios had mentioned the uh, Cypress Barrio, and uh, we just wanted to highlight a, a great feature that was highlighted actually on Tuesday, but um, it's... Uh, some work the staff did to try to highlight the historic nature of that barrio. And so if you go to the city's website, look up Historic Cypress Street Barrio, you will see this site with a whole bunch of history. And it's got an interactive piece, too, that includes um, both pictures, maps, as well as actually recorded art, audio of some of the um, people from that have memories from that era. And so um, Susan Galvin, in charge of our, our uh, community development department, is going to just play one of them. We'll see if the sound works on this. Yeah, we lived there in, uh, we used to call it uh, Mr. Lewis's court. Uh, he had a store, immense uh, clothing store downtown, but he owned most of Cy Cypress Street or, or um, well, a good portion of it, and we all rented from him. And uh, I don't know, we just, uh, since there were so many people from the same village we came from, Mm -hmm. uh, we're all kind of related, even if we were 30th cousins, but we we grew up mm -hmm. calling everybody aunt and uncle and my cousin, and mm -hmm. I, I was comfortable. Of course, I was 10 when we moved over here, and it was nice to have a yard where we could go out and play or sit here in the front porch, but uh, we kept in touch with all the, the people in the, well, we always called that the barrio. So that's just a little snippet of an interview that you can get the whole interview on this site and poke around, check it out. Um, and I think staff did a great job in trying to highlight the, um, the, the part that Cypress Street Barrio played in the past and, and some memories and, and how that works, uh, has worked in the past. Um, I'll also just highlight a couple things as my time's running short. Um, I know there were some points uh, brought up in the notes for this event talking about uh, updates on ADUs. Uh, in the... Orange, Old Town area of town. We have approximately 50 applications since March 21 that have come to the city. However, the actual percentages of being uh, projects being built is about 30% overall in the city of applications received. So that could put things at the 15 or so actual being built in Old Town. We don't have the exact number right on our fingertips for tonight. But um, certainly there's a lot more applications that come in when they see the complications, the amount of effort, the amount of dollars that go into having to build these things. Um, a lot of those applications <clears throat> go away. But we are monitoring that and working to make sure anything built meets city code. Um, and that's, I'll pass things off now with uh, that update on those items. Am I passing to Police Chief Adams? Oh, thank you, Rob. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, First, I want to thank OTPA for the uh, invitation tonight. I'm happy to be here, and any chance I get when I'm with uh, Council, I always thank uh, Mayor Murphy, Councilmember Barrios, and the entire City Council for their support of the uh, Orange Police Department and public safety. It's extremely important. Uh, we're very fortunate to have an extremely supportive uh, Council and government uh, of our Police Department, which uh, in these days is extremely important, so thank you. Um, a lot of you may not know, I'm a lifelong resident of Orange. In fact, I lived in uh, Old Town from 1969 to 1990. Um, and so it's pretty cool for me to be the leader of the, uh, the police department that I grew up in. I used to uh, frequent Radio Shack. It was my favorite spot. My mom would drag me to Satellite Market, you know, all those, all those cool things. So 
Uh, I have uh, strong roots in the city of Orange, and I'm, I'm super excited to be the, uh, the chief. So tonight I wanted to just touch briefly on uh, a few things. Uh, number one's crime. Tonight I brought our first ever 2021 annual crime report. Uh, Sergeant McMullen, who's in the back, uh, providing security for me tonight in case it got out of control. Just kidding. Uh, he has a stack of these. Please take one. Um, it's got a lot of information on here. Um, I actually gave a presentation at council a couple months ago, and a lot of people did not know uh, a lot of things we do. Uh, how many calls for service we have? 100,000, over 100,000. We're very busy uh, police department. So please grab one of these, enjoy it, uh, take it. Feel free to call us if you have any questions. Um, regarding crime in District 1, which, uh, you know, uh, encompasses Old Town, just a little bit smaller footprint than the entire district. Uh, fortunately, we saw decreases in almost everything last year. Residential burglaries, assaults, vandalism. We saw some minor increases in auto burglaries. You guys have all heard about catalytic converter thefts. Um, we tell people, please lock your car. Uh, we see a lot of people, you've probably seen it on social media, where people walk neighborhoods and just check door handles and whatever they find they take. So we've seen some increases in that. Uh, downtown, especially um, where it's dark sometimes. Um, or in a lot of the neighborhoods, it's dark. So um, I always like to say, please remember to lock your lock your cars. Don't leave your valuables in your cars uh, so that we can kind of try to decrease that trend. Um, our calls for service increased slightly from 2020 to 2021. We had 12,650 calls in the uh, downtown area in 2020 and 13,198 calls in 2021. Uh, that's likely due to some a, a little bit of an uptick in transient activity in the downtown, so we're getting a lot more calls. Um, the mayor touched on the Plaza Park. Uh, I just wanted to touch on a little bit more. Um, we average uh, six collisions into Plaza Park a year. That's the average. So when we had four already by uh, sometime in February, right, 2022, uh, the city attorney, myself, uh, the public works director, and the community services director, we all converged in the plaza the day after the last one and uh, tried to figure out what can we do while we're waiting for the bollard plan. And, you know, I know that takes a lot of work. So I just want to let everybody know that um, a lot of thought did go into that. It wasn't something that we just randomly said, hey, let's put up these ugly yellow delineators. Um, we did do it. We did put a lot of thought into it. And unfortunately, I know it's, it's, not, the, it's not the best thing. But like the mayor said, um, we haven't had any since. So. Knock on wood tonight that uh, that, that doesn't continue. Um, homelessness. Let's talk about that real quick. For everybody that doesn't know, we have eight full-time officer, officers that work specifically homeless-related issues. Um, last year, we were approved to hire two civilian homeless outreach workers. Uh, finding the right people for that was a challenge, to say the least. Um, but I'm happy to say tonight that we finally have two people that are in the very final stage of the background process, and we should be hiring them very, very soon, although it took almost a year. It's kind of disappointing, but they will greatly help our uh, offset our sworn officer uh, folks that are out there so that we can uh, free up some officers to do other things and hopefully get the homeless, the civilian homeless liaison outreach workers um, to be able to provide more assistance and resources to the homeless. Uh, a couple hot zones in Old Town for the homeless is obviously Hart Park uh, and Santiago Creek. Um, our heart guys, again, there's eight of them. Um, they work with the CHP, Caltrans, Santa Ana PD multiple times a month, specifically targeting the area. Um, you may have seen them down there if you're out there. I know I've talked to a couple of you who've seen them. Uh, removing abandoned property, making arrests when need to, uh, and we are there almost every day. So we're in both of those locations almost every day. We work with community services. They've trim trimmed some trees and bushes down there to help us out. And lastly, on, on the homeless front, we work every day to try to get resources to those people that need them. Um, and really, our, our problem is the only people that we can provide resources to are those who want them. Um, a lot of the folks that we run into in Orange, and we made thousands of contacts last year. Obviously, we don't have thousands of, the, of homeless in Orange, but multiple contacts with the same people. 1.8% uh, accepted resources or shelter. That's an extremely lo uh, low number and something that's not going to help end homelessness if people don't take shelter resources or, or our assistance or our guidance for assistance. Obviously, we can't, you know, ending homelessness doesn't, uh, won't, won't be furthered. So that's kind of a disappointment for us. Um, and then obviously, when it comes to loitering in parks, we get a lot of calls. Uh, 
you know, it's not illegal to be homeless and it's not illegal to be in a park during hours. So uh, our guys are at parks every day, uh, making sure that the parks remain safe, even though sometimes the homeless do tend to congregate there. So we are aware of it and uh, especially Chapman. Uh, you may not see the guys every day, but trust me, they're down there at least once or twice a day. Uh, regarding Chapman University, we have a great relationship with Chapman University. Um, new public safety chief uh, Rick Gonzalez is here tonight. Uh, he just took over recently and we meet once a month in my office and we talk about issues that we're having with Chapman, if there are any, and we, uh, we work through things and especially with Chapman parties. Last year in 2020, we had 244 Chapman related party calls. Um, I know that might seem like a lot. Uh, in uh, 2021, we had 139. So uh, obviously we had some COVID, you know, COVID uh, things in, in the middle of that, with that. Um, but we work together, and I know uh, Councilmember Barrios and Alyssa and Rick uh, all work with some of those houses where we have repeat problems, and we have been issuing citations um, when appropriate. Uh, and then on the, uh, well, when we had the Paseo, uh, there was a little undie run situation where we, we didn't want the undie run, everybody knows what the undie run is, we, did, we didn't want the undie run to happen while the plaza was closed. Uh, so there was a little... Little, little, uh, I'll call it shenanigans uh, <laughs> of kids trying to get around that, but we were able to uh, have a very safe event and uh, and not impact the Paseo. So uh, I could talk forever, as everybody knows who knows me. So I will stop there and be ready for any questions if you guys have it uh, at the end. So thank you, Alyssa. Perfect. It's, it's nice being able to go last. I feel like you all covered so much of what I was going to say already. Um, thanks so much for introducing uh, Dr. Rick Gonzalez, our new Chief of Public Safety. Just wanted to highlight him again. Many of you knew Chief Randy Burba, who's uh, retired after 17 years of service and is probably on his way to his uh, retirement in Nevada. So we wish him well. Also wanted to introduce Dr. Um, Al Vasquez as well, our Vice President for Enterprise Risk and Safety, who is overseeing public safety. So more faces that you'll see out in the community more and just wanted to give them a little shout out this evening. Okay, jumping into some campus planning projects, obviously the mayor talked a little bit about the Sandy Simon Center for Dance. We're at about 37% completion at this point. And you know, kind of uh, the theme of the night, there's been some delays due to COVID, labor shortages, supply chain issues, that kind of thing. But we're really uh, on schedule to meet uh, our deadline for fall semester this year. So we're gonna open back up for classes. Moving on to the Hilberts, obviously the mayor uh, talked about the three times expansion of that property. And so I just kind of want to be clear because I know the word expansion can be a little scary, um, that we're really utilizing the space that Chapman already owns to do that. So the property, if you've been to the Hilbert, there's the adjacent Partridge Dance Center. That, that's when the uh, Sandy, Simon, oh, excuse me, Sandy Simon Center for Dance comes online, the museum is actually gonna take over that property. So we're really utilizing the footprint Chapman already owns. And what's really gonna be exciting about that is there's going to be a community multi-purpose space as well. So we're hoping to bring in more school groups and tours and really bring more art and culture to the city here. We're really thrilled as well uh, with the reception we received from the Dine Review Committee earlier in this process. It was really fantastic. And again, we're on track for construction to start this June and it will be open again to the public in August of 2023. And thank you the city as well for supporting a temporary location for the museum during this time. It's actually gonna be just a few doors down on Chapman Avenue. So that's gonna be really exciting for us as well. Moving into one more project, which is Killifer School. And I know that this is something that's, that's a community jewel um, and that we all really value and appreciate. Right now we're in a pre-design and programming phase and really that's for us is our, our due diligence here. So we're looking at things like project goals and a scope of needs and really information gathering through observations and interviews. We still have a bit of, you know, some variables at play I'll say, but an ambitious timeline for us would be completion by summer 2024. A few commitments I just wanted to really kind of put out there today to you, number one, the site will include an exhibition of the history of the building and its significance within this desegregation as a whole. I know today's the Mendez versus Westminster uh, anniversary, so that's really, really uh, fantastic. The site will also include space for occasional community meeting. I know that was a really big concern with a lot of our neighbors as they wanted access, right? So we're still trying to figure out exactly what that looks like in operation, but that's something that we're really passionate about, committed to honoring the historical significance of the site and really just the presence of Killifer site in general. So we'll certainly be involving OTPA and various community members on that project moving forward. 
Moving on to student housing, uh, during the height of COVID-19, we were under state and county regulations that required us to temporarily reduce our housing occupancy. This fall, we're planning to be back to our normal uh, on-campus living requirement. For those who aren't familiar, it's 50% of our undergraduate student population, as well as uh, all first and second year students, assuming there's not a medical exemption or something like that. Really, we made that commitment to our community a few years ago, and we really intend to keep honoring that, so please know that. Chapman is examining a few options for our next student housing project, including as one option, a new construction at Panther Village that we've discussed previously. However, we've not reached a final decision at this time, and, and speaking frankly, I can't tell you when we will have a final decision on that, but I can say it's actively being worked on. The bond proceeds with which we're currently working are being invested to cover the annual debt service until final decisions on the property could be made. So we're really working adamantly. We understand the importance of housing. We understand that this is a shared interest for all of us in this room, and we're really committed to making that happen. And finally, to briefly touch on the specific plan amendment that Councilmember Barrios mentioned, <laughs> last year at this event, um, I was brand new to my position. And I remember talking to several of you about your concerns regarding student enrollment, particularly the FTE calculation. I know there was a lot of concern about that. People were concerned there was a little wishy-washy. There might be some room for kind of a, a little bit too much flexibility. So we really took that feedback to heart. And as a result, we removed the FTE calculation from the plan entirely. And I've shared before, you know, um, that the university has really been dedicated, especially over the past few years, to trying to engage in community dialogue. So again, we've removed the FTE from the plan and went with a strict headcount, which I'm hoping is more transparent and accessible to the community when you're able to review those plans. So I hope that that's a sign of good faith that we're listening. I really appreciate all the feedback that you send our way, either whether that's through me, through our president, however that comes through. As for the uh, more technical pieces from the CEQA perspective, we finalized our project description for the environmental impact report, and we've also initiated some of our technical analysis, so our historical resources, traffic, et cetera. We anticipate that the public review period for that will be late this summer, early fall. Uh, again, you know, COVID gave us a little bit of a delay, but that's uh, kind of where we're at currently. Well, thank you all. Uh, uh, many of the questions you've already answered, but I still have a stack, so I'm going to wade into them. But, uh, Mary, you mentioned the the uh, May 7th uh, Orange Parade, which is a great event here in Orange. I wanted to acknowledge that that's a project of the Chamber of Commerce, and I want to thank Al Ricky for being here tonight and also for insisting that that parade come back to Orange. And we've got to have faith in it. Each year it'll build. It'll get bigger and bigger. It'll compete with... Macy's Thanksgiving Break Parade and <laughs> the Tournament of Roses and uh, the Blue Angels and the Rockettes and we'll get uh, we'll be on international television. I also want to uh, thank Susan Galvin, the Director of Community Development uh, here in the city for being here and Anna Potocek. Uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, Dan Slater, former uh, city councilman, is here and Doug Willits, who was formerly on the uh, Planning Commission, uh, thank you all for coming, and also uh, Tina Richards, the editor of the of the uh, Foothill Century. So I'm going to wade into some of these some of these questions, and the first one is a tough one. Um, Police Chief, uh, can people do a ride along? Uh, not generally, no. Uh, we we keep them pretty. Uh, pretty tight just because of safety purposes um, on occasion we do them but it's not a it's not a general like you can't sign up and get a ride along but uh, chief they can they can join the um, citizens academy oh my gosh wow thank you glad you're, you're welcome. here uh, yeah absolutely uh, good one uh, our, everybody in our citizens academy which we do twice a year uh, does get a ride along um, so if any I don't know has anybody done the citizens academy in here so if you participate in our Citizens Academy, which you can get the information off our website, um, that's part of the program. And uh, not only is that part of a pro part of the program, but you learn uh, every person. I, I go to every class uh, at the beginning of every one. They're on Tuesdays, and I ask everybody questions. And by the end of the class, or by the last session, I can't even get out of there. You know, at the beginning, they they stop. They, they don't want to say anything. And at, at the last class, everybody has so many exciting things to share about the things they've learned about the police department. Thank you very much for that. I'm yes. not sure who is best to answer this, but 
The question is, what's going on with a very significant increase in flights? In other words, I think we're, we're frequently on the uh, John Wayne Airport flight pattern right over Old Town. Is, is, uh, is there anything we can do about that? I didn't well, think I so. I think that's FAA, <laughs> it's actually. A, it's, it's, a, it's FAA, uh, um, but there, are, uh, there is an airport commission that you can uh, report those things to. Part of it is keep in mind during the pandemic, the number of flights were reduced dramatically based on lack of travel, et cetera, et cetera. So some of it's going to be the number of flights that are now scheduled versus uh, before. But if there are, we'll, we'll get, a, we'll get a, a contact email and all that, and then you guys can post it. But there, there are ways to report it, especially if you're noticing certain times, if you're noticing yeah. after 11 p.m., for instance, or before 7 in the morning, those sorts of things, all those things can be reported through um, down to John Wayne. Well, at least the airport uh, closes at a reasonable time, and it's not, not all night long. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the new uh, fire station. What will be the process for the community giving input on what the uh, uh, determination of the existing fire station will be? We've got a needs assessment that we've consult or contracted for first, and then there'll be a public hearing process or a hearing process that we'll go through where we can take public input as well. Like I said, the big challenge to it is the expense that it would take to bring it to a condition where it is allowed for an external use. Um, both uh, many of you have probably gone through seismically retrofitting your homes, et cetera, so that's not a small task, and as well, there are limitations on uh, facilities in terms of accessibility and the rest that would have to be addressed beforehand. But that's all being done as a part of the needs assessment as well, and then we'll come back, discuss it in open session, and try and figure out the best uh, alternatives. So the com community will have an opportunity Absolutely. to speak Absolutely. up. Good. I think, Chief, Mr. Oh, Quinn, if I could also just please. add, I think it's uh, what people may or may not know is that the city um, property is not just the fire station itself, but there's that little bit of public parking and then that tiny little apartment complex, which I think is like four units, is also owned by Actually. six six units, is also owned by the city. So the needs assessment is looking at all of that um, all together to see what it is that we might vision for that area. And several residents have already written to me, you know, can we have another park right there? What, what, what can we do and when's the process? So we'll make sure that everybody hears about it and we share it with OTPA so you can get it out to your members as well. Yeah. Again, I want to remind the, uh, the viewing audience at home that if you have questions for the panel, the phone number to call is right up there, and we'll see that they're, we'll see that they're asked. Uh, Chief, is there a program for teens where they can be involved and learn about the police department and perhaps a career in law enforcement? Uh, we, have, we have our explorer group. Is that what you said, teens? Yes. The teenagers? We, we have our explorer group, which is uh, 16 to 20 years old. Uh, anybody can, uh, we, we can do it. I can connect with people here or uh, they can go to our website and find out about our Explorer program. Um, one thing we used to do, which we haven't done in many years, is a teen leadership academy or like a leadership orange. We've done it for uh, young, younger, uh, you know, teenagers, high schoolers. Uh, we're, we're looking to kick that back off. So, but if people want to be police officers or want to start on their way towards that journey, uh, being a police explorer would absolutely be the best fit and we would love to see them. Speaking of wanting to be a police officer, is it is it more difficult today to find qualified police officers? Uh, believe it or not, we've had no problem recruiting and hiring people. We hired 22 police officers last year, which was more than a couple other larger cities in Orange County. So uh, we've been very fortunate. Uh, of course, we have, you know, I, one thing that I promote is we have a very nice, safe city. We also have a very supportive city council, which I mentioned earlier. And you know, that, that's a big factor for people. They want to come to a place where they feel loved, and we have a big, you know, we're all about community here. So um, we haven't had that problem, um, and we, we enjoy not having that problem. So uh, the one thing that is going to be a factor, uh, not for us because I like everybody to have uh, degrees, uh, but in starting in uh, 2023, every, everybody will have to have a bachelor's degree to be a police officer. That's a new, uh, new law that's coming into effect. Our most... Uh applicants veterans uh no not at all no. uh, i would say a good number of them are uh no. if you if you go to uh any like a 
you mentioned the Blue Angels before. You go to a Blue Angels show or anything like that, you'll see booths and a lot of police departments will be there. A lot of big cities who hire hundreds of people at a time uh, will recruit heavily uh, from the armed forces. Um, but again, that's that's going to be a challenge for a lot of police departments when the uh, when the degree requirement comes into play. Do you do you have enough officers? Here's your chance. You got. Two we do, yeah. We have, we have, we we all. It's like I said in my presentation to council a couple months ago. You know, I'd love to have 50 motorcycle officers because I feel like everybody drives too fast. But uh, uh, we do have we have plenty of officers. Um, obviously, every chief would like more officers. Um, you know, one thing I've talked about over the last year or so is you know potential expansion in the East End, and we just need to start forecasting a little bit and planning for a little bit. And one of the things I've talked to uh, our new city manager about already. So. Um, we're, we're looking pretty good, but we hiring police officers is a annual or not an annual. It's an everyday thing. We hire uh, 20 all, all year. Yeah. How many do you have in the academy right now? Uh, we have 11 in the academy. So okay. yeah. good. Good. Uh, City Manager Houston, could you compare the last three budgets with this budget with the ratio of capital spending versus operating? Oh, no, wait a minute. That's unfair. You, <clears throat> you've only been here a month. The, the, um, the answer forget, is 42. Uh, yeah. <laughs> forget, forget that. Um, do we, uh, speaking of personnel, do we have open positions, senior positions in, in Orange? Are we, uh, are we in a good shape or do, are we looking for top people? Uh, top people as in department heads, like uh, our chief, fire chief, uh, department directors. We actually are uh, fully staffed. Bonnie Hagen, if anyone's met her, in charge of our community services group that handles recreation and uh, all the special event groups, is retiring. In, uh, she has her big retiring event next, next week. week. But her uh, number two deputy is uh, Leslie Hardy, great person, been groomed for several years, so she's going to step right in and take her spot. So we're fully staffed at the senior level. However, we are always looking for other positions in our 750 staff. And so if you want to look online, look for a job, check it out. We do have other positions. Well, we know you're looking for a replacement for uh, Marissa uh, Mosier, who was the uh, preservation planner. And I hope you you find somebody with equal or, or uh, more preservation experience to, to fill that. Uh, let me ask you about ADUs. Uh, it's pretty controversial in in in, uh, in Old Town uh, because of the, um, uh, the 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 density increase and what it does to the 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 idea of a home with a driveway and a garage and and uh, parking in the garage and so on. Um, it, there's an effort underway to, I think, rescind or or uh, or amend uh, Senate bills uh, nine and ten. Uh, are we part of that, or is the city uh, staying a, a, away from it? Or, and, Ariana, you might kn know a lot about that, too, the two Senate bills. Yep. Um, as far as I know, the effort to actually try and get a, um, signature for an signatures, I don't think that they met the requirements for signatures. Um, but what's interesting about most, uh, both of those bills, well, all of the bills that, you know, uh, address ADUs and the duplex, uh, the double duplex uh, bill that went through, is that most of them have built into them protections for Old Town, uh, for historic districts. So Old Town, as it's listed on the National Registry, doesn't necessarily fall in yeah. to those particular impacts, but it's all of the properties right on our edges um, that we're seeing the massive impacts for that. That's Cambridge, that's Mayfair, that's Everett. Those are the, you know, so it's right outside there. And obviously what's interesting about those bills is that they're really driving um, investors to come in, take properties for cash, uh, you know, uh, for Chapman students. Um, so it is an ongoing effort to address it and to really look at ways that we can use our ordinances to help protect long-term neighborhoods that are now being torn apart. Um, what's interesting right now is that you mentioned the housing and the dorms are not currently at full capacity. So I think we had five years that were pretty good. I think everybody was feeling like we were all getting along and, and we, could do, we could do this. 
then the, then COVID hit and then things went a little awry, a little off the rails. We have a lot of kids in the community than we've had in five or six years. Um, so it will be really interesting in just a couple of months to see what happens when all of a sudden they need to be back in the dorms. It's not a free for all in our neighborhoods. Um, and then I think we'll have a chance to really assess I don't think the market value is going to be there for this, the, the properties that have been taken over and put and had ADUs um, put into them. So it's, it's, it's a really tenuous situation right now that I think we're going to see some change in a couple of months. Yeah. One, one additional observation is historic properties are protected or exempted from SB 9 and 10 today, but I wouldn't rest too easily on that because I guarantee you given what I've been told by Senator Weiner and uh, the others that wrote on these things, they're not going to be satisfied with just this. This is sort of the nose in the tent, if you will. And um, I think we all need to remain vigilant because who would really honestly believe that it's okay to put eight, nine, 10 units on a single family property and reduce the setbacks not require any parking or green space and and believe that it's all right. I talked to one of the, these investment groups that uh, that you referenced and I'm gonna use that term loosely because I think it's more of a hit and run situation uh, for cash. And I asked them, I said, you know what? I said, if you're, are you proud of what you're doing here? Oh, well, you know, we're doing a great job in this act. Go great, would you live next door? Oh no, I wouldn't want to <laughs> live next door. And so to me, it's just, you know, it's testament. You don't have to have parking spaces on site for the, all of the units as long as there is a mass transit opportunity within a half mile. So yeah. it's a really a symptom of a super majority and a desire to try and force fit a solution uh, into everywhere except for the, some of the locations that are already that way. And I think we got to just stay hot on it and continue to try and push back I even suggested, gosh, why, why, if this is for affordable housing, because that's the premise when you talk to the folks that authored this stuff, why on earth then don't you put a deed restriction on the units and say, hey, they've got to remain affordable, they've got to be either low or very low for the next, and I'll go, I'll go, I'll go um, conservative, I'll say only 30 years versus the 50 and 60 that some of the other financing, oh no, we, we don't want to do that. So there's really a different intent in some of this, and I think we just all got to remain vigilant, whether it hits your particular property today or um, it's going to be threatened um, before it's done because, like I said, I, I don't believe they're, they're finished. It's sort of like watching Prop 13 and some of those things, too. I mean, there's a lot of movement out there to try and change things, and uh, I, I, I just think it, it's really important to, to stay. And like you say, it'll be on the perimeter if not, if not in Old Town as well, and that's that's not good for anybody concerned either. Sorry, I, no, I, I I'm pretty I'm pretty. Uh, that's something that no, uh, troubles me greatly. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, this one, either for you, Mayor, or the City Manager, is there a value in the City of Orange having a certified local government program? We don't know yet. I mean, to be honest with you, we haven't. We've looked at it from time to time. We'll continue to explore, but um, honestly, at this point, I'm not sure what the additional value would be given the historic district and the things that we've already seen of value. If somebody can bring it forward, we'll consider it. But uh, from my end of things, um, you know, we're, we've got the protections in place from a historic standpoint, and I'm not sure what else it would bring. Yeah. All right. Um, we haven't seen any movies or television commercials being shot in Old Town lately. Do we still pursue these opportunities? Um, is there, uh, we still have an office for it, right? Yeah, we it used to be. We, we, Susan's yeah. shaking her head, so I'm saying yes. Yeah, <clears throat> I can simply say there's no plan to uh, push them away, and we still will receive applications, I think, just for whatever reason. The, lately, there hasn't been much action, but we're still open for business. And there have been a couple of car commercials actually shot in the last year here. Used to be a lot of them, it seemed to me. Uh, yeah. um, but uh, Tom, I, I think they're probably shooting in, in cheaper uh, states like Georgia and, 
and uh, even in Canada now. Mm -hmm. um, the Paseo. Uh, what are we going to do with the future of the Paseo? Uh, there are three opportunities. Either don't have it come back, make it permanent, or make it seasonal. Uh, is the city the city is in a process of of study? Can you give us a status on that study, and if there will be a community uh, presentation? Yes, actually, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's analysis going on. There'll be a community meeting. I think there's a workshop being planned in early May. Um, I don't know that we have a date, absolute date yet, but we will publish it as soon as we do. And then we're going to be very pragmatic about the process. It's one of those things. There were lessons learned in the in the Paseo, and you know, frankly, it was an emergency situation when it was set up. But the lessons learned, we if there's value there moving forward, we should look at that as well. And that's why we're doing the analysis and such up front. Then we'll bring it back. We'll get community input. We'll go through uh, the public process, and people can participate and be active along that way. And there's lots of varieties and ways um, to uh, to do uh, um, pieces of it along the way too. I mean, you know, um, some cities I talk to haven't uh, ever opened certain streets back up from uh, when they closed them. Uh, I believe one of the streets in Laguna Beach. Um, I was talking to the mayor over there uh, that they've they've maintained it, and they were interested in some of the parklet area type concepts and such, but. All of the aesthetic looks as well as the options and the rest will be for public consumption and review, and we're looking for everybody's comments and ideas uh, moving forward on it. But I do think there are lessons there that we at least need to, at least need to consider along the way. Maybe it's as simple as uh, sidewalk, additional sidewalk dining, et cetera. I mean, I'm, I, don't, I, I haven't... From my mind of things, it's wide open. We, we'll, we'll see what we've come up with and see maybe, you know, maybe there's a good idea in the audience here that just hasn't been, uh, hasn't been brought forward yet. I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah. Uh, Chief, what are the specific stats on crime in, in Old Town? I, th I think you, uh, in your presentation, had a report, and as I understand it, there's copies here uh, that may detail all this, but can you give us a snapshot on crime in Old Town and, and what it is? Is it car break-ins? Is it home invasions? Is it, uh, what is it? I'd say the majority of it is just like I said at the beginning, it, it's property crimes. That's, that's going to be the majority of the crime we see down here. Um, we don't have a lot of violent crime. Um, some people may have heard we did have a, a, a transient uh, break into several houses last week. Uh, we did catch that person. Uh, that was down here um, around the Chapman University area, but for the most part, um, we live in a pretty pretty darn safe city, I'll say, right now. So, um, yeah, realistically, I'd say property crimes is the, the biggest thing affecting downtown, and fortunately, we have uh, quite a few cops that work down here, so Good. properly covered. Ariana, here's, here's a project for you. When will Old Town get historic street lamps instead of modern lamps? Any particular kind you would like? <laughs> no? I think, I think okay. there's somebody on Schaefer that has an idea. I, I, I think there, there is, and I know that that's been looked at in the past, and um, with some of the, uh, the expansions that have gone with Chapman, that's where you see the beautiful overhead acorn lights come in, but the ones like we have on Schaefer Street um, down by Hart Park, um, the expense for those is, they're beautiful. I would like nothing better than to have those everywhere in Old Town, um, but we would just look for a way to fund them. So that would be something. But I do, if I if I may, I'd like to go back to the Paseo really quickly, and I just want to, again, go back and thank the um, residents of Old Town because you really made your voices heard about how you feel about that particular it went on for 18 months. That was a long period of time to have a major thoroughfare in our, in our uh, downtown area closed. Um, so for all the traffic you endured, the parking issues you endured, the bus changes you endured, um, I just thank you for actually making yourselves available to doing your part during COVID, but then also making your voices heard, and we're going to need those voices again. It will be vital that um, OTPA and Old Town residents 
have their voices heard in this discussion. Where the council left it at last was seasonal, but what does seasonal mean? The last discussion was, well, April through the street fair. That's a really long period of time. You know, so you will be asked to be activated, to get out, to be part of those meetings, to submit public comments, because it's going to be a really important, um, you're gonna be affected more than anyone. So your voices will be really important in that discussion. Alyssa, it's your turn. Um, are all freshmen and sophomores now living on campus at Chapman University? Not currently because we're still under the federal guidelines that limited occupancy. All first years were required this year to live on campus, but the second years were not this year. Both will be required yeah. in the fall. And when, when that's accomplished, what percent of the students will be housed on campus? So it's a 50% commitment. It might be slightly higher depending what our enrollment looks like in the fall, but it is the commitment of 50% when we combine those two years of classes. You know we'd like... OTPA would like to see that about 65. I do, uh, yes. So I hope you're working towards that. What is the plan for a groundbreaking at on the I-5 property, which could accommodate eight or 900 students with a high rise? It's not in the historic district, so you don't have the limitations that we would have here. What's the plan for groundbreaking? Um, as I mentioned previously, we're still evaluating a few options in that property, but some of you may remember we were able to purchase the property adjacent to our existing Panther Village uh, from the city a few years back. That's definitely an area we've identified as you know a high uh, possibility that we're going to develop it. However, when we purchased Chapman Grand, the facility out in Anaheim where we're housing about 900 students as well, um, we didn't have the funds to continue to develop that property after purchasing Chapman Grand. So I don't have a timeline as of now, but I can tell you that we're working on it. But the, the future housing includes the development of Panther Village, uh, the demolition of the existing, right? and then a whole complex involving the current Panther Village and the, the undeveloped, unimproved property on I-5, isn't that? That. It could be a couple of different options. So that is certainly one of them. It could be a demolish of the existing Panther Village and you're putting a high rise. It could be another adjacent building to it. There's still a lot of uh, things kind of being discussed at the Board of Trustee level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's still a little bit of uh, things that we need to work on. And when you bought the uh, old uh, Chapman Grand, and, or Catella Grand, I guess it was, it was and made yeah. it into Chapman Grand, mm -hmm. that added uh, several hundred is there a plan for something similar, uh, another Chapman Grand? You know, that's something that I think we would love if an opportunity presented itself. Um, you know, we did that with Panther Village. We took over the hotel, right, and transformed it into a residence hall. Same with Chapman Grand. I think the more students we can, you know, get utilizing our shuttles will reduce the traffic. The more students we can put in the residence halls is also a win. So if that were to come up as a possibility, I, I can imagine that our administration and board would be very interested in that possibility. Uh, now, the, the current SP7 plan is in an EIR uh, development, right? Correct. Study right now. And when would that come out? So if we're staying on track, we're looking at a late summer, early fall and for then, public comment. And that'll, of course, be made public. And of course. we'll have an opportunity to, to, to comment on it and, and get involved with it. Is there any public uh, hearing or presentation planned by Chapman before the release of the EIR? Likely there will be. Um, we recognize that, you know, it's been a bit of a stop and go process on this plan for, for quite a bit. Thank you to the city for being so flexible and, and generous with us. I recognize because it's been so long, some of it might not be at top of mind for our residents immediately. So we'll likely do a community meeting before the EIR hits just to give a refresher of what's included, uh, you know, what was analyzed. And so that will definitely be coming down the pike. Uh, the chief said that uh, there's a... Uh, uh, the, the, there's a decrease in the number of, of significant party calls, right? Yes. But it's still high. Uh, and, of course, it's still unacceptable to the, to the community. Um, wh what is Chapman doing to try and lessen that even more? Yeah, I think what's really interesting is when you look at the statistics, um, so all, was it 240-ish that first year, something like that you had mentioned, 
not all of those parties are loud and unruly or considered a violation of the city ordinance. So we have a really fantastic liaison at the Orange Police Department, Sergeant Sarah Costa, who just joined us. And so she's actually been really great at tell telling us, you know, kind of what is OPD looking for when they go out to address an issue like this? I keep hitting the microphone. I'm sorry. Um, one of them is obviously, you know, is it a loud and unruly party? Is there underage drinking involved? Are you seeing, you know, red solo cups on the lawn? That kind of thing. So not every call that comes in is a violation of an ordinance. However, we have a really fantastic program where we work very closely, again, with OPD, with our public safety team, with code enforcement, whatever the situation may be, as well as someone from my staff. And we go out and do liaison visits pretty frequently every single week. Every Monday afternoon is dedicated to going out with the team to show a unified presence that, hey, we're communicating, we're all working together and have a shared interest. So if there is a citation that's given, that is most definitely forwarded to our student conduct office. Uh, violations for that can range anywhere from what we, I kind of liken to traffic school, which is uh, our good neighbor course. It's like a three hour educational intervention. It can lead to a fine being put on the student's bill between $400 and $800, depending on the severity. Oftentimes, you know, if you have a parent who might be paying that tuition bill, they'll, they'll kind of see that fee and say, hey, what's going on there? What's this about? Um, and then finally, you know, in the most dire of circumstances, it could be a separation from campus. So there are processes in place if there isn't allowed an unruly violation, if there's a violation of some type of law or code. Um, additionally, with code enforcement, they're able to come out and cite. Uh, we see frequently with parties, or excuse me, parking, trash cans, a lot of those things. And so Public Works has also been fantastic at assisting us with that. So we have a really great structure for responding to all sorts of misconduct. Um, and we definitely want to nip it in the bud. And if please, you know, that's an invitation. If you see anything, please give us a call or send us an email, send a smoke signal, whatever it may be. We definitely want to nip it in the bud if we can. Well, I have to say, compared to a few years ago, it's certainly uh, decreased. And, and uh, um, I, I attribute a lot of that to Chapman's aggressiveness in providing student housing. So they have a supervised uh, place, which is a better environment f for students anyway, I think, to experience uh, college fully. Uh, so thank you for, for, for all you're doing. What are you doing in Irvine? Are you moving any of what is academic in, uh, in uh, Old Town to the Irvine campus where you have uh, plenty of room for expansion? Yeah, so our Irvine campus, there's a lot of really exciting things. For those who don't know, we have a campus near the Spectrum, and it houses all of our graduate health science programs. So our pharmacy school, uh, physician assistant, those kinds of programs. A lot of our four plus one programs, which is you take basically a bachelor's degree, and then you have one year, and you're able to earn a master's degree as well. Some of those health science programs have been doing classes down there as well. I know there's a lot of talk um, on our provost uh, side of the house on which programs we may be able to you know, host additional classes down in Irvine. We have a shuttle that runs between the campuses as well, which is really efficient for students who might be taking class in both places. Well, we sure urge you to increase the housing uh, for this campus. And of course, it's a, it's a revenue center for, Absolutely. for universities. So I, th I think you would, uh, you know, you would want to do that. And uh, philanthropically, I think people are starting to give more generously than they did two or three years ago. You might call Elton Musk. <laughs> and Sandy, if I could just add on, because yeah. I actually, as a new council member, went out with the teams for part of OPD and um, public safety when they went and did the, the checks at the beginning of the year. And one of the things I was so surprised about is that the houses that were identified as problem houses, and it isn't always an unruly party, if there's just activity, a kind of an overabundance of activity next door to you all the time, you know, it's not just the red solo cup, it's the surprising desire to relieve oneself on somebody else's lawn that's going to send somebody over the edge. And I don't blame them. But Absolutely. when we were going from house to house, it was how many houses were occupied by large numbers of students. We're not talking about two and three. We're talking about the houses become a fraternity because um, they were all boy houses, I want to say. The ones we visited yes, were boy exactly. houses. They're yes. all boy houses. And so you have a large number of students there, which I think, and this is, again, something OTPA fought for many years ago, was about our boarding house rules and going back and revisiting that and saying, okay, 
are we enforcing this properly? And what tools do we have to say, you know what, this isn't allowed here. It just isn't. Um, and there's been some squishiness about, well, they all go under one lease or they sublet so we can't tell. I think that's a, just a terrible excuse. If you have 12 people living in a house and they're paying rent, we should be able to figure that out. We are adults, we're grown ups. they're not, we should figure this out. So this is something that to me, and so I know a lot of the neighbors, um, it's really important and it's something we can figure out and we need to go after it. Um, will Chapman consider agreeing to a, an, an enrollment cap? In other that, words, you're at, you're at what now, 85? Mm -hmm. Hundred and the SB plan takes it to ten fifty to yeah, um, but uh, it it can't go on f forever. Is there? There's got to be a reasonable cap. Can the university? Is the university in a position to agree to a cap with the community now? You know, I think I've, I've, I've said this before. Our president has kind of gone on the record and, and said, you know, we're pretty landlocked in Orange. There's not really a ton of extra space for us to go, to be completely yeah. honest with you. So he's been very, you know, transparent in that way. Personally, I can't sit here today and tell you that we will put a cap, you know, a hard cap. That is kind yeah. of a little bit above my pay grade. That would have to come from our president's office. But we're very well aware of the limitations that currently exist with our campus. And, you know, kind of uh, that's why it's been so adamant um, of a priority for us to really utilize our existing spaces, not to, you know, acquire additional property or increase square footage that we're acquiring, using what we have and maximizing its effectiveness. So that's been a theme yeah. that we've been trying to work on. One question on homelessness, um, either mayor or, or, or chief or, or city manager. One, uh, one inquiry was, is it, is it possible to think about building a Disney-like parking structure where the homeless would have spaces assigned. And on every Wednesday, uh, they would vacate and it would be hosed down and disinfected. And on Tuesday, medical students would circulate and administer whatever needs they had medically. Is that, uh, is that something uh, you could consider? Is there space for that? Is there property? I, I would just say that the, the areas that have tested or tried uh, parking lot types of scenarios have, have uh, routinely gone away from them after a few months, and so I would be a bit suspect. We continuously look along the lines of what can we do in this continuum of care um, scenario to try and help those that will accept some help. I'm really proud that Orange was the first place to host uh, Be Well OC, which is down on the west side. It is a, it is a closed um, facility that you are escorted in or authorized in and out of for a continuous range of care. But um, parking type scenarios, at least the ones I'm familiar with, have not been real successful, including in some of our surrounding uh, areas. I mean, you know, we, we listen to all the ideas and try and, and try and sort things out where we can, but uh, um, the Be Well OC approach in terms, of, uh, in terms of getting actual treatment and the rest and getting them on a new trajectory rather than continuing on the, on the old trajectories, I think, one, it's a proven method. Two, it continues to grow. There's a second facility being built in Irvine as we speak, and a third one targeted for the northern end. And I'm a lot more comfortable in that sort of a concept, at least from my observation, versus um, trying to uh, sort of do the car camp uh, type scenario with us. And I'll look to the chief or any of my colleagues that have have additional thoughts there, but that to, that would be my visceral reaction. Haven't Good. heard that kind of a proposal before. But. I also, because this is constantly online and in social media and people are asking about it, so I just put some information out recently because um, the police, as, as Chief Adams had mentioned, they're down at Hart Park, they're down at Santiago Creek. In addition, what you're starting to see now is a change in public policy. So where we have gone so far, you know, um, being driven by Sacramento in terms of the leniency towards homeless, homelessness and that type of policy, you're starting to see a shift. 
Um, just a couple of weeks ago, the governor announced the creation of care courts, um, which would actually allow cities, police, um, and uh, different agencies to actually arrest and put people into the system. So not necessarily criminal, but diversion courts that would get them the mental health um, help, would get them the substance abuse help that they need, um, which is something we can't do right now. Chief Adams mentioned that earlier. Yeah. You cannot arrest someone for homelessness. Um, but once they have stepped over a line, we can get them into the system and get them the help that they need. And that's something that's been lacking. So again, I think you're starting to see a swing back to a, a much more a uh, common sense approach because there is nothing compassionate about leaving people on the street. Thank you. I'm going to ask Tony Trabuco, our past president, to uh, bring up some of the questions we've received from the uh, viewing audience. Tony. Thank you, Sandy. Um, a lot of these, uh, or there are several, I should say, that are uh, related to Chapman University. I think a lot of those or some of those have been addressed. So um, just try to pick an, uh, a couple. Um, one actually just relates to the neighbor to neighbor um, publication, which which I think we all get. Um, but it's a little bit critical. It says, what's the Chapman neighbors of Chapman or why is the, the neighbors of Chapman a commercial ad for Chapman rather than addressing actual neighborhood Chapman issues as it was intended? Thanks for that question. Um, I uh, I think that what we've tried to do with the content in that piece is show some of the good things that Chapman is contributing to the community, whether that's, you know, culturally, artistically, you know, whether that, you know, kind of um, really impacts the community in a positive way. Once we start making progress, more progress, I should say, on the specific plan, we're planning to use that newsletter to deliver more specific updates for those specific projects. We also put our minutes, if you're unaware, our minutes from our neighborhood advisory committee meetings are available online that you can download and read anytime you want, where we provide updates on all of the projects Chapman is currently working on. We discuss student misconduct, we discuss the specific plan. So those are available as well as an additional resource. Um, but I can definitely take that feedback back to uh, our marketing team and share that. Thank you. Okay, quickly, uh, for the police uh, chief, any thought of a task force or some other type of enhanced enforcement for high-powered speeding vehicles on Cambridge and on Walnut. We hear racing late at night. Straight yeah, so we, uh, we have uh, nine motorcycle officers who uh, specialize in doing um, special enforcement, things like that. So anytime we do get uh, information that there's a trend, uh, we will put together our own task force. Sometimes we, uh, we work with the CHP for when we have... Uh, uh, 18 wheelers that do things like that. But uh, what we need is we need the, the folks to call in. Uh, we do have a traffic special uh, uh, hotline that goes directly to a, a one of our traffic um, officers. We also have Sergeant McMullen here who can, um, you know, provide phone numbers. But we are, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm a big, I'm a big guy. <laughs> traffic is a big important thing to me. Uh, you know, it bugs me when my wife and I drive, or we, we come to we come to uh, the plaza on Fridays sometimes in the morning, and it just bugs me uh, to see cars flying through there. And I always call and bother my captains and say, "Get a motor down here." So um, we're, we're more than welcome to uh, to jump on that. We just need we need people to tell us. We need people to help us because we only have so many uh, so many motors out there. Perfect. Thank you, Chief. Um, along those lines, and and in terms of alerting the city. Um, obviously, the, I think the app was man mentioned earlier, um, and somebody did make a comment that maybe the city can add Chapman party calls to its app. I don't know if that's a if that's a possibility now, but it's not really a question, but just a statement that that was made. We'll, we'll take a note of it. The app's pretty adaptable, so you can uh, you can do a lot of things with it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, where does the city of Orange stand in comparison to neighboring cities like Santa Ana and Anaheim? when it comes to bringing some of our federal and state tax dollars back back to the city? Well, I, I mentioned it earlier. <clears throat> the the most recent or the current example will be the uh, the delivery next week of a little bit in excess of $2 million of park fund money that's coming from the federal government uh, via Lou Correa's office. But Orange has done a good job in that area across the whole bandwidth, whether you're looking at the funds that were related to COVID um, the distribution of those funds that both came from uh, the federal as well as state and was distributed through the, the uh, county 
we were fortunate that uh, our supervisor, uh, Don Wagner, um, basically just divided it up based on population, passed it through, didn't delay things. So we had access to those funds much more quickly uh, uh, than uh, a lot of our, our neighbors did. But, um, you know, we continue to look for opportunities to compete for those sorts of things, whether it be related through uh, Measure M on the traffic and circulation side, we do pretty well. Uh, but, um, you know, state funds where available, uh, federal funds certainly more prevalent these days based on some of the current administration's uh, um, resources. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and really just one last one. Like I said, there was quite a few um, questions regarding Chapman University. And I think we, you know, kind of uh, addressed a lot of those. Um, this one's a pretty simple one, although I don't know that there's a, an answer. Uh, is there a plan to have a grocery store at Old Town? <laughs> Well, I do think um, there is a, a deli that's opening up at the old, uh, what my, me and my family have called the little store on Palm Street. Right. So I'm really excited to see that open. Um, but uh, I have not heard of anybody. I know for me, I would be really excited about a Trader Joe's coming into our neighborhood. But um, so I, <laughs> thank you. Um, but I have not heard of any plans of any um, local markets coming in in the in the immediate vicinity. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I think we know of a small one that's a potential, but not about the she, store. I have okay. When you're done talking about the store, go ahead. Racing to the store. No, it's not about the store. Are you done about the store? Sorry. Yep, we're done about the store. Uh, I wanted to give. Uh, I realized that question for me about the speeding vehicles uh, on Walnut was from somebody watching. So uh, if whoever uh, asked that question wants to, wants to email pdinfo at orangepd.org and Sergeant McMullen will, uh, will address that concern. So I just wanted to give that person the, uh, the info. Perfect. Thank you, Chief. Uh, and I lied. One last one, and then I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, loading and unloading in the plaza and on the residential streets around the plaza are out of control. Does the city consider loading and unloading when permitting or uh, giving permits to businesses? Uh, I don't know the permitting question, but I know that a lot of this has to do with uh, Uber, Uber Eats, all that stuff. Uh, we've actually talked at the police department about uh, more signage so that we can enforce that greater. We do have the, uh, the, the spots on the end of the streets uh, in the plaza, I forget what that's called, that are, that are lined. But I think we need to do a little bit better, uh, probably signage to make that so people can't uh, just put their hazard lights on and think it's okay. Uh, and I think they're night. talking about large scale trucks for delivery, which is really. Oh, big trucks, big trucks. Big trucks yeah. are a problem. That too. There, yeah. there is a delivery plan that is required with the permitting process when a new uh, entity comes into town. And then I guess it's a compliance issue past that. Uh, plus, you're only as good as the delivery driver and whether he pays attention to the directions that are, are provided. And we've all seen the double park and some of those things as well. But, but as a part of the plans, when there's an application that comes in for, for any sort of business that is uh, resource intensive, i.e. restaurants, et cetera, there, they, they do have to demonstrate how and when and why and, and the, how, how they're going to do that without impacting um, the uh, neighbors. But I think, Tony, it's really, I mean, I said it at the top of my comments that we're kind of at this really interesting crossroads where Old Town is concerned. And for everything we've talked about, the Chapman growth and business encroachment, ADUs, boarding houses, all of it, you know, the Old Town specific plan was put into place originally 30 years ago. And I would, I would argue that by any stretch of the imagination that we have wildly succeeded in that plan. We are now so far beyond where that plan imagined. It's possibly time that we revisit it again, that we have a larger conversation about this. You know, at what point have we gone beyond success into an imbalance? And what do we need to do to stay in balance? And that's certainly something that I'll be calling for in the, in the months ahead, because I think we're really at that point where we need to have that kind of tough conversation. Great. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Guy Hendricks. Thank you, Joe Peters, for helping tonight. Thank all of you for coming and our terrific viewing audience. I hope it's been informative, educational, and it's brought you a little closer uh, to government. Please thank our panel for their participation. <laughs> we have refreshments outside and the panel will be out there if you'd like to say hello. So thank you again for coming and good night.